So um, again, thank you very much for coming. Um, I think probably lots of you will have been to our seminars before, hopefully. So the format is we've got three speakers and they're going to speak for um, roughly sort of 10, 15 minutes. And hopefully there should be an opportunity for a bit of a discussion um, chat at the end. We'll see how it goes. Um, so uh, our second speaker is uh, unable to join us in person because of patchy Wi-Fi at the museum's conference. But she's, we've got a recorded um, presentation from her. So everybody is here and uh, we're going to kick off with Amber Butchart, who delighted can join us uh, this afternoon. Amber is a curator, writer and broadcaster. Uh, you've quite likely seen her on the telly, um, if not on her own uh, documentary for BBC uh, called A Stitch in Time, then quite possibly on the Great British Sewing Bee. Um, her current exhibition she's uh, curated is called The Fabric of Democracy, Propaganda Textiles from the French Revolution to Brexit, which sounds a very fascinating title. So get yourselves down to the London Fashion and Textile Museum if you want to see that. And she's written a book, well, many books, in fact, but one um, entitled Nautical Chic, which is particularly pertinent to this afternoon's presentation. And not only that, she grew up by the seaside and still lives by the seaside. So she's eminently well qualified. Um, so uh, do you want to share your screen and take it away, Amber, for us? Definitely. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine. Let me uh, get this shared. OK, great. Hopefully, hopefully that should be working. Great. Good, good, good. OK, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, as Catherine mentioned, the seaside has always um, formed part of my life and or research. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is going to be just a bit of an overview of some of what I hope are the lesser known intersections of the seaside and style that I've come across in my research over the years. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm a dress historian and curator and I wrote a book called Nautical Chic. This looked at the impact of the sea on our wardrobes. And I did a lot of research for that book in my hometown of Lowestoft on the Suffolk coast. I now live in Margate on the Kent coast, which is the other beach that inspires much of my current research into the seaside as a fashionable space. So I wanted to begin with the present with something that's been in the news quite a lot over the last few years uh, and something which in the past has really helped to create this idea of the seaside as a fashionable place and space. And that is the potential health benefits of cold water and of the sea itself. So these are just some of the articles from the last few years on uh, the potential health benefits of cold water swimming. And I'm sure many of you, um, you know, if you are seaside enthusiasts, maybe you are year round sea swimmers and I'm sure you've come across these studies if so. So um, the first one up here at the top left, um, this study was in the news a lot in 2020 as researchers from Cambridge University found that cold water swimming may big caveat there, may protect the brain from degenerative diseases. The research was at an early stage, and I should add the disclaimer that we have to add that cold water immersion can be very dangerous if you're not used to it. But this is one of a number of reports over the last few years that have talked about the potential positive effects of cold water swimming from a health perspective. Um, on the right, um, it's also been studied in relation to menopause and alleviating menopause uh, or perimenopause symptoms. So this is from August 2020. Um, and it detailed another study that's currently underway. Researchers said that if the results are positive, it could even lead to more GPs socially prescribing um, cold water swimming. Um, and below that, we can see this article from a year before in Vogue. This is just one of many, many, many articles that have been written over the last few years on the anecdotal mental health benefits of swimming in cold, open water. So... As we can see, the buzzing euphoria of cold water swimming is enjoying a renaissance. And in terms of fashion, we find this lure of health and wellness really at the centre of what initially made the seaside a fashionable place. 
So it was in the 18th century that sea bathing first became fashionable, spurred on by doctors and other medical officials who advocated the health giving qualities of taking the water. For example, a doctor named John Anderson wrote a treatise specifically about sea bathing in Margate in 1795. Um, I know that there's obviously the very well-known uh, 1750s one based in Brighton, but there was also this one in Margate in the later uh, 18th century. So he wrote this after he recuperated here after a long and severe fever. He wrote about the sea baths and he said that they are certainly most excellent auxiliaries to medicine, diet, exercise and amusement, which accounts for the great flux and reflux of company from the king to the beggar to and from the sea watering places during the temperate seasons. The bountiful ocean answers the peremptory demands of thousands and tens of thousands of proper claimants each year which again gives a sense of the scale of these kind of coastal visits by this time. Now there was sea bathing at Margate from at least the mid 1730s, and it became a key destination for wealthy Londoners looking to take the sea cure. And different to many other coastal resorts, Margate did not have to rely on the arrival of the the sea of the railways um, because people would travel up and down the Thames um, by uh, sail ships called hoys or, and then later by steel steamships as well. So very early uh, bathing resort. Um, and this became evident in the later town motto, Porta Maris Porta Salutis, a gate of the sea and a haven of health. The Royal Sea Bathing Infirmary was founded here in 1791 and opened about five years later. And around 40 years earlier, a local glove and breeches maker named Benjamin Beale had created the modesty hood for bathing machines. So visitors could be dipped with a modicum of privacy. Women might or might not, as we can see here with Thomas uh, Rowlandson, wear a bathing gown, which was similar to the shift or chemise that was worn underneath dry clothing. This is an item which was really key to ideas around sanitation and cleanliness at the time. So in terms of like land clothing, let's say, it's the item that you would wear closest to your skin, closest to your body before you put anything on your, your uh, you know, stays, corset, whatever. Sea bathing, as I'm sure you all know, became so fashionable that Jane Austen satirized the obsession with resorts and sea bathing in her unfinished novel, Sanditon, that she was writing at the time of her death in 1817. In the novel, one of her characters quips, saline air and immersion will be the very thing. And this kind of has a double meaning um, when it's said in the novel, because it means not only for their health, but also for their recently acquired fashionable lifestyle. So from this time, the seaside also became a site of fashionable display. Here we can see some fashion plates from the Queen magazine um, and uh, for either promenading or in fact swimwear on the right hand side and a very nautical promenade in Punch magazine in the centre. So from the earliest days of coastal tourism, when the coast crossed over from a place of work to a place of leisure, it has been dominated by the idea of fashionable display, the desire to see and be seen. In European retreats, such as San Sebastian and Biarritz, the presence of royalty set the trends for the leisured classes. In Britain, as we just heard, doctors advocated the health-giving qualities of taking the water, and 18th century aristocrats duly responded. The evolution of the railways throughout the following century increased these excursions to the sea, and discussions of health and well-being were gradually superseded by the lure of pleasure. The annual trip to the coast soon became essential for the maintenance of a fashionable lifestyle, as increasing numbers of resorts evolved from spa towns or from picturesque fishing villages. Magazines advised on the best dress to wear for strolling, bathing and boating, often with appropriate nautical flourishes. A French magazine called La Corbeille wrote in 1855, Attire for bathing beaches and spas is every bit as, if not even more elegant than, clothes for walking along the Champs-Élysées 
or the Bois de Boulogne. So as a holiday destination, a level of sartorial ostentation was tolerated at the seaside that wasn't viewed as acceptable in urban spaces. It was really a place where social rules could be broken. And we really see that in these uh, images here, these outlandish seaside fashions promenading on the pier as satirised in Punch. These are by the illustrator Edward Lindley Sanborn, who worked for Punch from 1867 until his death in 1910. And he was the creator of uh, this series, Mr Punch's Designs After Nature, which I love. Now, these cartoons gently mocked the fashions of the Victorian era, likening their extreme silhouettes to the animal kingdom, as we can see. And as we can also see here, peers became increasingly important at resorts as architectural innovations and centres of pleasure and fashion. They were a consistent feature of guidebooks and they had the potential to make or break a resort. Piers provided, of course, a picturesque platform for the spectacular display of fashionable attire. So seaside destinations relied on glamour as a selling point and their piers and promenades became the forerunner to the catwalk as the season's finest was regularly paraded by the water. This heady holiday atmosphere led to relaxed moral codes as well as relaxed wardrobes. The Queen magazine raged in 1900 there are the young ladies, perfectly decorous and well-behaved in London, who give themselves up to abandon on piers and other public places. However, as much as the seaside became a place of fashion and leisure, it was also, of course, a place of work. And this is where I wanted to move on to consider fisher folk. So these are studio portraits of the uh, of, of women who were known as colour coats fishwives in the northeast, not far from Newcastle. These are studio souvenir souvenir postcards, and what we see in all of the kind of um, uh, many of these souvenir postcards, not just of fisher folk, but across a, a variety of different areas, was Victorian nostalgia for pre-industrial life being commodified and packaged into sanitized postcards. Fisherwives were quite popular subjects. Through these fisherwives, we see the romanticization of rural and coastal life. Now the fishing industry dominated coastal towns such as Lowestoft in Suffolk for about a century until the end of the 1960s, providing employment for much of the population, both around the year and seasonally as workers followed herring shoals down the coast, where women would join local girls in gutting, packing and salting the catch. Grueling work for 10 to 15 hours a day resulted in a staggering 854 million herring being sort sorted in just 14 weeks when the industry was at its peak in 1913. And I don't know if any of you saw it, but there was actually an article in The Guardian this weekend about how the kipper is making a comeback. So becoming um, uh, very fashionable again. And now, as with much seafaring work that could be hazardous and demanded clothing that protected from the elements, there was a great desire to dress to impress in scarce leisure time, and especially what became known as Sunday best. And this is similar across many working communities at this time. So for fisher girls traveling down the coast, Sunday best dresses were carefully packed alongside oilskin or leather aprons and other accoutrements of the profession. And here we can see um, fisherwives wearing their best clothes, which included printed silk or cotton blouses with matching aprons. So the colour coats fishwives were quite well known for their distinctive dress, as were other groups of fishwives working around the British Isles. And certain styles even crossed over into fashionable dress, again, satirised by punch. Um, I love this image so much. We were able to use this in the nautical sheet book. I have a whole chapter on on um, fishing, the fisherman as a, as a sort of style icon in the sort of crossover of um clothing from this, you know, this uh, work where it really needed to perform a particular purpose and it's sort of transition into fashionable dress as well. 
So as we can see, this satirizes how styles of fisher wives were copied and modified by women of fashion. And we see this in other countries too, and going into the 20th century, the Spanish couturier Balenciaga, known as one of the absolute masters of couture in the 20th century, claimed to be inspired at one point by women selling fish at the market in Marseille. The particular way of folding the skirts and folding the apron is something that he incorporated into some of his designs. So fisherwives were subject to complaints throughout the 19th century that they emasculated their husbands because they worked the markets and so had a degree of independence. This was compounded by the centuries old practice of breaching the skirts. Um, so there are many reports of women, especially not necessarily at the market, but if they are um, you know, uh, hunting for bait, things like this, they might tie their skirts up, effectively breach them, turn them into trousers. A notable early commentator on fisherwives was the novelist Fanny Burney in the 18th century, who wrote of Devonshire fishwives, their dress is barbarous. They have stays half laced, so their corsets are not done up properly. No shoes or stockings, notwithstanding the hard pebbles and stones all along the beach. And their coat, their petticoat, is pinned up in the shape of a pair of trousers, leaving them wholly naked to the knee. Mr. Weston declares he could not have imagined such a race of females existed in a civilized country. Somewhat problematic language there, but even with her quite sardonic tone, it really shows these women to be rebellious figures and quite uh, independent figures. So to move on to the men, and I will hurry up, I know I don't have much time left. These are from Southwold Museum and the Maritime Museum <coughs> in Lowestoft. These are images of local fishermen, um, from early in the uh, in the twentieth century, wearing um, you know the sort of classic uh, garb, smocks, boots, uh, pipes as well. Um, and this type of style of clothing, I think it's interesting to consider how it's becoming fashionable again today. For example, the company Yarmouth Oilskins, um, absolute favorite of mine, continue to make smocks in this style and have been manufacturing them on the quay in Great Yarmouth for over a century now. And they sell all over. They are not selling just to fishermen. I don't know if they sell to any fishermen anymore, to be fair. There's a huge market in Japan you know, various places. It's very interesting to think about this kind of rise of workwear. So then I wanted to move on to finish off by thinking about uh, fisher men and fisher boys a bit later in the century. Um, when I was researching at the Maritime Museum in Lowestoft and the library in Lowestoft, I came across stories of the Lowestoft fisher boys in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and I was lucky enough to actually interview some of the people who were involved uh, with this. You can see the store Lawrence Green here. Um, I spoke to Spencer Green, the son of the tailor Lawrence Green. And I also spoke to a man named Joe Neve who worked with Lawrence for 19 years from 1954. So Lawrence Green was the local tailor where the boys would design their suits. And then Spencer took the business over. So a lot of this information is from those interviews. So this is all about the lowest of the fisher boys. They would spend 10 to 14 days at sea at a time, and then they'd have two to three days on shore. It's a pretty arduous life. And as the boys came off the ships to this scarce leisure time, this competitive system of dress developed. They would attempt to outdo each other with their ostentatious suits. They would design the suits themselves. They would sketch them, pick the fabrics, often from samples that had previously been designated as women's wear fabrics. They would compete to be the most finely attired when on land. The suits could have velvet piping and in inlays combined with bright color checks and contrasting lapels. These were not uncommon features. And they would often get two pairs of trousers made, one wide flare and one drain pipe. These suits cost a week's wages in the early 1960s, and they would be worn out to dances at the weekend. Joe Neve told me that the Fisher boys would get four or five suits made each year at least, and some trouser bottoms had a 26 or 28 inch flare with contrasting color turnups and cuffs on the sleeves, amazing. 
I found a great report in the Eastern Evening News from March 1964, which wrote that the lowest of Fisher boys were among the most flamboyant dresses in the country, wearing suits of shocking pink, primrose yellow and kingfisher blue. Here are some other images. Some of these images are provided by Peter Wiley, who is an artist also from Lowestoft, who has researched uh, this, these, these um, practices as well. Now, through these pictures, we can see a bit of the evolution of the style. In the top left, we can see these are almost resembling zoot suits, which were worn especially in America in the 1930s and 40s, this oversized style. There are also similarities with teddy boy style in some of the images as well. So this subcultural element really feeds into the idea of the seaside as a site of more eccentric or exaggerated styles. During the 1960s, British beaches, including Margate, were the meeting point of choice for mods and rockers, later reimagined in the film, uh, film Quadrophenia. Uh, the 1960s generation was picked up in the local paper at the time as well. The paper was contacted from people from even further away, uh, um, Grimsby, Hull, Lancashire, who also recalled that their local fishermen dressed uh, distinctively. We see this again in the Eastern Evening News from June 1965. The love of striking colours when they came ashore has long been a characteristic of fisher lads in many parts of the country. Fisher lads of Leon C, Essex, on Sundays, these fisher lads appeared in well-washed, flat-front, white duck trousers, sometimes with fringed bell-bottoms, the effect of which was enhanced by zebra-striped smocks on which each lad had his full name embroidered on the front. Amazing. So we can see that the seaside, whether it's a place of work or a place of leisure, has a long history of being fashionable and of cultivating fashionable dressing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Amber. That that was a, a very wide ranging, fantastic introduction to the subject. And I wish I could have gone out with uh, of an evening with some of those lo lower stuff Fisher boys because they just look the bee's knees, didn't they? I mean, fantastic, as you say. Um, yeah, if, if anybody wants to put sort of questions in the chat, then we can come back to those later, hopefully. Um, but yeah, really brilliant start. Thank you very much. There's a lot to, to kind of um, think about in that talk. So that's a brilliant introduction. Thank you very much, Amber. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker, um, who I said is, as I mentioned, is not actually with us at the moment. Um, but Kiara Phipps is the director of Southend Museums. And so she oversees all the aspects of the museum's delivery programming and strategic forward planning. But she is also um, her specialist interest is in uh, textile, collect the textile collection, and, and uh, she has expertise in uh, dynamic fashion exhibition making. So um, she is going to be talking about, I think we're ready to go. Uh, she is going to be talking to us about the bathing costume collection that uh, is housed at Southend Museum. So um, are we OK? Hello everyone, um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm sorry I'm actually doing this as a recording yeah. rather than live at the event because I'm actually in Newcastle at the Museum Association Conference at the moment so I couldn't find anywhere that would be quiet enough to deliver tomorrow for the event so you've got me in recording today. Um, but yeah, I'm delighted to be here to talk about um, our beautiful collection of swimwear, something that's real kind of interest of mine. Um, so I suppose what I'll do is just give you a background just who I am, uh, the collections that we have, um, the spaces that we're working in, and then I'll talk about the collection itself. Um, so my name's Kira Phipps and I'm the director of South End Museum. So kind of oversee everything we do, including the kind of strategic vision of the service. But I'm also fortunate enough to curate um, the odd kind of collection based exhibition every few years when I can. So that's a real joy for me. Um, I also am responsible for all the collections that we hold, including the care and storage of all of these, working with a really fabulous conservation and curatorial team. 
So I originally moved to the museum service about 10 years ago now to catalogue research and create a collections management plan for this really kind of beautiful collection of swimwear that I'll be talking about shortly, um, alongside delivering a touring exhibition of the swimwear that ended up going to about eight venues around the UK. So this was an Arts Council England funded project um, that was kind of focused on broadening access uh, to this really wonderful collection, which was donated to the museum service in 2006. Um, but before I go more into that, I'll just give you a kind of overview of who we are and our venues and so on. So we have four venues within South End Museum Service. Um, we've also got an offsite store as well. Um, so we've got Central Museum and Planetarium, which is home to displays of social history, natural history and archaeology. We've got the Beecroft Art Gallery, which has fine art from our collection, including oils, watercolours, prints, drawings and sculpture on display. We also have a wonderful programme of temporary exhibitions in the gallery as well of local artists work. Uh, the gallery also has the services fashion and textiles collection, which has a rolling programme of collections based exhibitions every year in our dedicated fashion space which is great um, and we also have two very beautiful historic properties Pritwell Priory which is a Cluniac Priory in Priory Park and South Church Hall which is a medieval moated manor house in South Church Gardens. So to give you an idea of the individual collections we hold, uh, the fine art collection dates from around 1600 to present day with works by Constable Rossetti, Sir Joshua Reynolds and numerous old mass paintings as well as kind of photography, drawing and sculpture. Our fashion and textiles collection numbers over 7,000 pieces ranging in date from around 1640 to present day and our kind of social history collection as well as lots of other things has the largest collection of echo radios domestic design and memorabilia in the world um, and our natural history collection which is really vast has some kind of incredible examples of of local and national specimens of flora and fauna including the extremely important collection of taxidermy uh, by john davy hoy so finally our archaeology collection can contains um, two internationally significant finds, the Anglo-Saxon Pritwell Princely Burial and the London Shipwreck Assemblage. So the London is a second rate naval warship that blew up about a mile off the end of South End Pier. Um, and kind of, it was on its way to fight in the second Anglo-Dutch war, but sadly came to its end at the end of the pier. Um, so we've got this incredible assemblage from that collection as well. So moving on to our swimwear collection, um, this collection was donated to the museum in 2006 by a, the family of a woman called Mavis Plume. Um, she had been directed to the museum service uh, by the V&A originally. Um, so Mavis had been collecting swimwear throughout her life. Um, she'd created her own hire and photography studio called Studio Margaret. Um, and the kind of the range and swim of uh, the range of swimwear collected by Mavis was really incredible, um, kind of demonstrated a very representative uh, collection. She kind of ensured that she had examples from each decade from around 1841 onwards. Um, some decades have numerous examples from each year, uh, with the strongest decades being the kind of 20s to the 60s. So some of the earliest examples appear to be replicas that were made in house uh, with the kind of the earliest original example being a bathing bell from around 1885. Um, there were also swimming aids, swimming hats, beach shoes and some beach pyjamas in the collection as well, which is really fantastic. Um, as you can see from some of these images, Mavis used a model to pose in the swimwear in the studio to advertise the garments that were available to hire essentially. Uh, we do have numerous examples of these photos. These are just a small selection. Um, my favourite ones are the ones that are kind of have props here <laughs> that she's posing with. So those are quite fun. Um, so this collection of Studio Margaret Aquatogs was, as it says in her previous, um, in the previous image, this is a leaflet that was kind of advertising the studio. So it was a collection of bathing costumes uh, that were available to hire to clubs, organisations, local authorities, businesses, advertising agencies, film companies, theatrical groups and individuals, as she kind of says it here in her leaflet. Um, she goes on to say the collection consisted of bathing gowns, smocks, tunics, dresses, ensembles, combination chemises, sheaths, regulation and corporation swimsuits and bikinis, along with all the other kind of accessories that I've already mentioned. 
So the leaflet says that each costume is complete with accessories where applicable and can be supplied with shoes where considerable walking is to be done um, or without shoes when the costumes to go into the water. Um, it goes on to say that the costumes have already been hired for every conceivable occasion, including swimming galas, the opening of pools, pool centenaries, carnival floats, individual float entries, cabaret dances, fashion displays, static displays and wax figures, which is quite interesting, um, television, films, theatricals, women's institute shows, local scout and cub shows, Christmas morning swims, sponsored swims, reviews and fancy dress. <laughs> so obviously a lot of places she was hiring these kind of costumes out to. The leaflet closes with the sentence, whatever the day, event or occasion, there must be a bathing costume or selection exactly right for you, which I just thought was brilliant. So as you can see here, Mavis directed and starred in photo shoots at the beach, wearing examples from her own collection. So this is Mavis here looking rather glorious, posing as a modern mermaid, as she says here in the caption. Uh, these examples are from a book that Mavis wrote in which she says in her foreword that this is kind of, I suppose it's a, an up to date record of bathing fashions, which may be used with confidence by biographers, students, film and stage producers and others interested in the subject. So she goes on to say that it's its further object is to show not only the development of costumes, but the reasons and events which influence design to show in a humorous manner that period costume looked like in their natural environment, but not to the extent of ridicule. Further, this book may serve to publicise in some small manner those early bathers and swimmers who were really pioneers in a movement to overcome traditionally encumbrous dress for a sport which demands the minimum of clothes. Such women who dared ridicule and worse should not be held to further mockery but rather higher claim. Finally, it may bring to the public's notice a sport which is neglected by so many individuals and authorities yet should be put to high on the list of education and recreational pursuits for all ages. Mavis goes on to thank Janssen, the company's Janssen and De Cross, for assisting with her research as well as for lending her suits um, that she didn't have in her collection so she could test them out and see how they kind of fared in real life. So it was clear that she was engaging with makers and designers as well as wearers and researchers to write this book. So moving on to some examples from the collection now, just to give you an idea of what we've got. These are just a small handful um, and they happen to be the ones that we've got professional photography of, which made it much easier to choose. Um, otherwise, I could have included hundreds of examples, um, but these are just a few. So I'll go through each of them. So the white suit on the right is a really beautiful nylon one piece with glass beading that was made by Original Trend in around 1955. So this kind of heavily beaded decoration would have made this bathing suit very impractical for swimming, but kind of perfect for sunbathing and parading. So it's very highly decorative finish. Um, could be trans it could transform this one piece into an evening uh, garment with the addition of a skirt worn over the top. So it does feel very contemporary. I think it's a really beautiful, really beautiful swimsuit in person. We've got some nice examples here of two pieces. Um, the blue one dating to around 1950 to 53 with a nautical inspired striped design, some really lovely bra braiding detail at the top there. Um, there's halter neckties as well. Um, these were kind of beginning to be used to highlight the decolletage in a more shapely way than they had been before. And the kind of high waist of the bottoms uh, adhere to the golden rule of ensuring that you were covering your waist up much kind of higher past your navel to ensure that you were kind of maintaining your modesty. The beautiful red floral two piece uh, was made by Martin White and dates to around 1950 to 55. Um, the kind of tight waffle ruching and shearing has given this kind of two piece suit its really figure fitting shape. Uh, the red panel on the briefs hold in the tummy whilst kind of working with the bra top to create the illusion of that kind of hourglass silhouette that was obviously so desirable at this, at this time in the 50s. Um, we've got some incredible examples of men's swimwear here. Um, we've got a bold kind of 1980s animal print speedo. We've also got some swimming thongs for men from the 1920s. So these swimming thongs have been explored as examples of queer culture within our collections as they often um, 
had been worn for kind of posing in muscle magazines as well as for swimming and other exercise. So throughout this period, there was a focus on the kind of improvement of the male body um, and kind of fitness regimes and exercises being photographed and displayed in magazines. But these magazines promoting this kind of muscle building were often viewed in the queer community as erotic material rather than just as kind of promotional how to kind of get fit guides. So these are really interesting examples that we've got. Um, this very beautiful green one piece uh, was made by Janssen. It's called Capri, which is a great name for a swimsuit, isn't it? Uh, this is made from wool and lastex and it dates to around 1948. Um, so for Janssen, like lots of other companies at the time, Lastex was this kind of miracle yarn. Um, it allows this one piece to stretch in all directions um, whilst also giving the, the kind of suit its really figure fitting shape. Um, unlike kind of earlier examples of bathing, woolen bathing suits that would kind of really sag when wet. Um, Lastex allowed bathing suit designers to kind of create more flattering suits that again was kind of synonymous with this desirable body shape, whilst also being much more practical than they previously had been. So the kind of the neckline of this one piece suit is a bit of a precursor to the kind of plunging necklines of the 1950s. And it, it does have um, detachable straps that could transform it into a strapless bathing suit, which were kind of perfect for tanning, which again was quite a pastime um, at this time to kind of look like you had a tan. So this example on the, the right, I suppose it would be for you, is a, uh, a very beautiful kind of sea creature um, inspired utility clothing scheme two, pay, two piece that was um, made from wool. Um, it's dating to around, well, 1941 to 50, the, the scheme uh, being that's kind of how, where we got the dates from for that one. The, the rough edging of the top of these kind of briefs would suggest that it was originally a one piece bathing suit. And we do actually have a one piece uh, that's the kind of same sea creature design but in a different colourway um, which suggests that someone's adapted this style as kind of um, adapted the the swimsuit as stars have kind of began changing really. So making do and mending was obviously very common during the 1940s due to the kind of lack of resources in World War II. So the British government introduced the utility clothing scheme in 1941 to encourage designers to make more fashionable and kind of affordable clothing using much less fabric um, and expensive materials. So this is a really kind of unique example here. The uh, incredible silver lame piece um, that you can see here has been made by De Cross in around 1965 to 69. Um, so the silver lame fabric gives this bathing suit a really kind of futuristic look, which was all the rage at this time, uh, with kind of futuristic fashion booming, really, thanks to the space age or the space look that was promoted by designers such as Pierre, uh, such as Pierre Cardin, André Courage and Paco Rabanne. Uh, the bottom half of this one piece is actually much softer and much less structured than kind of previous uh, examples from the earlier decade because the 60s kind of was demonstrating this move towards freedom and comfort, uh, which saw a decline of that kind of internal boning and corsetry associated with the kind of 19, the very rigid structured 1950s swimwear. The black example next to the silver uh, was made by Blue Lake and it was made from brine nylon between 1965 and 69 again. Um, the cutout sides and the very kind of high hip line of this fairly revealing bathing suit also display those kind of freer attitudes towards the body in the late 60s. Um, brine nylon held its shape really well when it was wet, so it was ideal for swimwear. And it also allowed for much more kind of daring shapes and patterns to be created, which you can see here. And then finally, this very lovely example um, of a very, a very small bikini um, from 67 to 69. This was made by Riviera and it's called Oasis. So this is made from a polyester glazed cotton. Um, it's got this lovely kind of vibrant harlequin design, which is very, it's quite theatrical, isn't it? Um, there's adjustable tie straps, which allowed the wearer to remove the bra top much more easily when sunbathing, which again was kind of commonplace by the late 1960s. Uh, the minimal fabric and the low cut of the briefs made this bikini ideal for strapless tanning, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, and is obviously a far cry from the kind of earlier modesty dressmaker swimsuits of the previous decades. So we have been able to add to our collection. Um, 
We have added some contemporary examples, including an, a lovely one piece by Sea Folly, but we are always open to adding to this collection through donation. Um, so if you have any historical contemporary swimsuits that you're willing to donate to the museum service, just send us an email uh, as the email you can see there, museums at southend.gov.uk, um, because we'd love to hear from you. We're always looking to kind of find ways in which we can add to this collection, ensuring that we're not kind of duplicating what we've already got, but, you know, covering some of the things that we don't have. Um, so I hope this has given you kind of a small insight into our kind of vast swimwear collection at Southend Museums. It's one of the largest swimwear collections in the UK. Um, and I suppose it's an insight into the wonderful world of Mavis Plume and her studio business. Um, but if you've got any questions, please do just um, just send them through to our museum email and my colleague Vittorio is is on hand to answer any in the audience if you've got any kind of burning questions. Um, but yeah, thank you again for having me. and. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to hear how it's gone. So thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent, Kira. Um, really great to see a little glimpse of that. I feel like we ought to be organising a kind of Seaside Heritage Network coach trip off to South End to go and have a look at all the, the rest of the collection because it sounds fantastic, as does the wonderful Mavis. I think you'll agree. Um, so. Uh, Given the, the time, I think we're going to make, um, without further ado, we're going to go on to our final speaker, Tommy Brezovic, from, who's all the way from uh, Slovenia. Uh, and uh, we're very delighted to have your own perspective on uh, bathing costumes as a collector yourself um, and um, curator of an exhibition all about life on the beach along the Adriatic coast. Um, and I know you've got lots of slides, so I'm very much looking forward to um to this presentation. So do you want to take it away, Tommy? Yeah, you know, the floor and uh, I'll just switch to uh, screen sharing. Okay. Okay. This is just, uh, instead of my introduction, uh, my name is Tommy Brezovic. I uh, teach at the uh, Faculty of Tourism Studies at the University of Primorska, which is uh, situated in Porto Rosso. You can see on the map on the, on the screen, where this is located. It's um, in northern part of Adriatic Sea, just across the sea from Venice, uh, which I, unfortunately, I, I cannot see it across the sea, but in two hours by boat, I can reach Venice. So uh, what you see on screen is the nearby city, uh, the town of Piran. And I'm right now sitting, if you see my, my cursor, I'm sitting somewhere. Okay, I'm sitting right here now. <laughs> Um, when tourism started here, uh, the area was under uh, Austrian and Hungarian Empire. And the, the red dots that you see on the map are seaside destinations that were that, that started uh, the development of seaside tourism in Austria-Hungary Empire. This started actually quite late compared to uh, England or, let's say, northern coast of Europe. Uh, we started with tourism and sea bathing at the beginning of the 19th century, which is quite late compared to other parts of Europe. Um, at the time, Austria did not took much care about uh, seaside in terms of tourism development because they were actually uh, supporting tourism development at uh, their inland spas and uh, watering places. The coast was a kind of um, neglected area uh, because it was supposed to be for fishermen and seamen, and those are people who high society of Vienna didn't want to have much to do with. So the coast was a kind of uh, left apart, and uh, until um, actually tourism in other parts of Europe started to show some economic benefits, so then the Austrian government started to think, well, maybe it's something into it. And they started with uh, development of tourism as well. So, um, as I said, we started with tourism quite late, the early 20th century. I'm, when I say early, I mean, it's 19, uh, sorry, 1820s, 1830s. And uh, it was developed in terms of actually uh, floating baths. Uh, and I will talk about that just in a minute. But before I want to stress uh, some other elements that were important in, uh, for the type of sea bathing that has developed in this area, which is, uh, first one is uh, quite late translation into Italian of Richard Russell's book on 
the positive uh, elements of uh, sea and, and sea water for human health. Uh, this happens about 60 years after when the book first uh, was published in, in, in Britain. So it's again quite late. Then the second element is morphology of the area, which uh, you saw on the slide before, is quite a rocky coast, no sandy beaches, uh, quite deep water close to the shore. So no way of doing any bathing with bathing machines or something similar that uh, has developed in other parts of mostly Northern Europe. And then again, um, I want just to spend a word or two about the season. Actually, the uh, sea ba bathing or actually spending holidays at the seaside was actually a winter event and not a summer event. Actually, people were coming from Vienna, for example, which was the capital and the, and the biggest city of the empire. They were coming on the coast during the November, December up to April month because it was uh, a way to escape harsh winter in Vienna. So they come to the coast with mild temperatures at around 8 to 10 degrees. Well, today we have uh, 15 degrees and sunshine outside. Uh, while during the summer it was too hot, so they escaped back to their mountain uh, uh, destinations in Tyrol or in to, what is today uh, Bohemia or Czech Republic in, in the spas. So the uh, coast was quite not very popular during the summer. I'm talking about the early days of uh, using the coast. Later on, sea bathing became popular and, of course, summer became uh, the month to visit the coast. Uh, what we see here on the picture is the first bathing facility that was built in Trieste in 1823. And actually, it was the first facility built on the Adriatic coast. Uh, it consisted of a floating platform with uh, many individual cabins that were equipped with a cage hanging on ropes. And with the pulleys, they were, you know, lowering the cage with a swimmer into or with a bather into the into the sea, and I usually compare that with a, and I call it a tea bag bathing. You know, it's like you put the people in the cage, and you put it in the water, and after five minutes, you take it up, and then in again through the pulling, like this. And this was a kind of um, the only method in order to put people in the water, because not many knew how to swim, and the water was, as I said, very deep, at the beginning, at the shore, so you can you could not walk for I don't know ten meters or fifteen meters with the water up to the knees, but water was was soon up to the throat. So if you could not swim, you wouldn't enter the water. The swimming platforms were quite popular at the time. Here we see a plan for building a similar bathing facility in my hometown in Porto Roche. This was a plan uh, at the mid nineteenth century, eighteen fifty six. It's a mixture of two types of uh, bouncing facility, which is a consisted of a uh, floating platform, which you see here at the bottom, and a U-shaped facility, which was accessible from the land. And this was just the plan that was never realized. Uh, actually, we are still researching the possibility that the idea was stolen by Trieste, because just two years after, a similar bathing facility was built in Trieste, in terms of, you can, you can see the platform here, it was called the uh, Banyo, uh, Banyo Maria. And my speculation is that the project was moved from Port Roche to Trieste because just a year earlier, a railway from Vienna to Trieste was uh, finished. And so the inflow of uh, tourists and visitors coming from Vienna to Trieste was quite strong. So they needed a bathing facility there and not uh, on in, in Port Roche, which is an hour away from Trieste. Well, eventually, a few decades later, only in uh, 1890, bathing started also in the Bay of Porto Roche. And you can see here the first hotel. And you can also see people dressed fashionably. Those are, let's say, upper class of society. This was coming to Porto Roche for spending their summer holidays. Actually, the destination was uh, getting quite popular very in, in a short uh, period of time, in about 10 to 15 years, from zero tourists up to several thousands of tourists every year. 
uh, unfortunately, the First World War broke up and tourism had stopped for quite, quite some time. What you see here is the way how people that were coming to Port Roche were using the, the beach. Not that much for swimming, uh, but more for socializing, uh, walking along the coast, breathing the sea air. Um, while bathing, yes, of course it happened, but in a much uh, lower volume that we, we would expect. This is the first bathing facility built in Port Roche, which is a really small one, like 10 cabins. There were such facilities, one for men and one for women. Uh, eventually, um, only families were allowed to bath together, like husband and a wife, together with kids. Otherwise, uh, men and women uh, were separated. This is a group picture that represents a kind of an average group of visitors and bathers in Port Roche at the beginning of the, ninth, of the 20th century, just a few years before the war. This picture was taken in 1909. And you can see from the from the dresses and the bathing suits that they were not nothing special. This was not a fancy dress. They were not, you know, um, clothes to show your status or whatever. They were really practical dresses to be used in order to enjoy enjoy the sea. Uh, we can see the difference between between men and female dresses. Male were quite copy pasted. You know, the, the only difference was the the thickness of the stripes were it thin or, or thick. Uh, the material was usually cotton or wool. Uh, and this was going on. So this type of bathing suits uh, was popular until the 1920s. Here are a few other examples of uh, those type of bathing suits. I tried to colorize some black and white pictures in order to see that maybe the program will, the artificial intelligence will reveal the colors of the black and white uh, bathing suit. But unfortunately, uh, I came up only with the blue and, and black uh, swim suits, while the other picture is actually uh, originally colorized, uh, as you can see. It. Uh, besides bathers, uh, you know, some other population also came to, uh, was coming to Port Roche, and, and this is actually the upper class of Vienna society. They were never taking uh, sea baths. They were just walking along the coast, dressed as if they would be walking in Vienna. Um, those people who were taking sea baths were usually young people, men and women, and children. If you were 50 and over, you were not expected to go into the sea. So it was not something not acceptable by 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 uh, by the society. Uh, the older population would rather take some boat trips to nearby destinations, maybe a trip to Trieste or a trip to Venice, and coming back, and of course always taking pictures to, you know, re for, to remember their trip to the seaside because the seaside in Austria-Hungarian Empire was quite an exotic area. You know, th th this was a Central European country with Alps, with uh, Pannonian flats, with uh, spas and everything. And the coast for, for Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire was a kind of uh, a military zone with a, with a navy and, and uh, a big trade port, which was Trieste. Tourism came, as I said, quite late. So going to the coast in 1910, was still an, an uh, exotic uh, endeavor. Well, after the First War, things changed. The area passed from Austro-Hungarian Empire into the uh, Kingdom of Italy. And the 20s and 30s and, and the fashion of the of the period and the music and everything, the, the way of people were living was quite different. And you can see through the fashion, through the style, through the, through the colors and design of uh, bathing suits, also the change of society or market segments that were coming to uh, this area. They were not any more high society people, as you saw them nicely dressed before. They were like um, upper middle class and middle class people. Uh, little shop owners, teachers, uh, government officials, you know, this, this type of people could afford holidays at the seaside. And you can see a uh, female figure was uh, usually used in promotional materials, always dressed in a bathing suit. 
kind of uh, convey the, the message that uh, this is fun, this is sunshine, uh, sea sand and, and sun was actually invented in the 20th century. If we move on with the representation of uh, typical visitors of the era, again, um, it was very fashionable to make group pictures. I have like hundreds and hundreds of pictures like this one of baiters standing in water or on, a, on, a, on shore, uh, taking picture in uh, bathing suits. Uh, here you can see uh, quite a diff different design than we saw 20 years earlier. Uh, very figure showing uh, clothes, still with modesty skirt, um, mostly made of uh, wool and cotton still. Colors were much more, uh, I mean, the, the bathing suits were much, much more colorful, not that many dark blue or black, but rather green and red and yellow, uh, very colorful uh, dresses. Again, if you look at this picture, you can see uh, that the um, you, you won't find old people, maybe a person or two, but the rest is just young people, uh, couples with kids, uh, many children uh, coming, uh, well, staying in the water and, and enjoying the seaside because the older population was still unable to swim. That's why they were quite afraid of water and they were staying out of it while younger generations learned how to swim and they were much more open to, to experience the sea. But I have to say um, that after the war, in the early 20s, uh, tourist destinations along the Eastern coast in, in northern Adriatic, they were hosting a lot of uh, orphans from the war. And you can see here a group of uh, Hungarian kids that were sent to the seaside uh, as a kind of compensation because they lost, lost the father during the war or maybe their house was burned during the, 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 the uh, fights and so on. Um, you can see they, they don't even have uh, bathing suits. They are bathing in, in underwear or, you know, very, very... Uh, cheap and, and, and poor dresses just to enter the water, but still to cover the body. And this is a typical non-bathing uh, group of people, a summer picture. You can see all uh, wearing some light colored uh, clothes, white, beige, uh, and, and, and uh, other bright colors. Well, the, with the winter picture, this one is uh, April 1, 1925, 26. You can see like uh, people dressed like in, in, in towns or cities. Oh, sorry. Uh, of course, uh, the seaside was uh, always um, a place where new trends in, in design and fashion were shown. Uh, I think somebody mentioned already the pajamas, uh, beach pajamas. And actually, you can see this uh, a leaflet from, from Port Road, where Revista del Pijamas or Espiaggio, which means um, a show off of pajamas on the beach uh, was proposed for the month of July, and actually people were walking around the town with with their own pajamas. It's you know they are not doing this anymore, but it was common not only in Mediterranean destinations. There is a, a postcard from England, I think it's it's from the 1930s, which again shows the popularity of pajamas and you know joking about this uh, this event. Uh, after Second World War, this was another war that stopped tourism dynamic in this area. Uh, the area again changed the political entity, and from Italy, the area, the, the Eastern Peninsula and Eastern Adriatic became part of then Socialist Yugoslavia, which uh, actually has was not open uh, to, to foreign tourists until mid sixties. So the, the early tourists in the end of 40s and 50s were usually workers cam coming on the seaside a kind of as a kind of compensation for their hard work in the factories. They were allowed like two weeks on the seaside and paid by the company and they just enjoyed the sea. Uh, worker unions were actually uh, managing all this uh, tourism traffic, domestic tourism traffic at the time. Well, in the 1960s, uh, Yugoslavia became aware that tourism is actually a good economic thing and that people are bringing money in without uh, much effort. So they opened the borders. People from uh, Western Europe started to pour in uh, because Yugoslavia was, in contrast to Poland and Czech Republic or Eastern Germany and so on, 
was not part of Eastern Bloc, was not uh, ruled by Soviet um, uh, Soviet Union, was not part of their their business deal. Actually, in 1948, there was a quarrel between Tito, who was the president of Yugoslavia, and Stalin, and Yugoslavia was was expelled expelled by uh, from the group of socialist countries from the Eastern Bloc. But still, for Western Europe, this was a kind of um, you know, a magical thing. Let's go and see how these socialist countries are doing and, and uh, how tourism and how life is there. And um, since the borders were open and the prices were cheap, the sunshine was shining, the sea was nice, the fish was good. So tourists from Germany, Italy, uh, England, uh, Benelux, uh, Scandinavian countries were coming in hundreds and hundreds. Really, it was Yugoslavia um, at the time in the 60s and 70s was third or fourth uh, by the number of foreign visitors in Europe, uh, those are uh, this. This is a tourism promotion that was, uh, you know, published in the sixties and seventies and into the eighties, uh, which were the era of um, golden era for tourism in the in the in, uh, Yugoslavia, because we know that at the end of the eighties and the early nineties, Yugoslavia fell apart and actually tourism stopped again. So every twenty, every thirty years. We have a war that is stopping tourism in on, on the Adriatic. So uh, this is a typical picture that could be taken in the 70s or 80s. A lot of people on the beach from all around Europe. Um, and you could see in terms of uh, fashion and bathing fashion, you could see here designs from uh, German companies, Italian companies, British companies, Swedish, because people coming from all those countries, they brought their bathing suits and... Uh, of course, everything was present here. Uh, at the time in Yugoslavia, each republic of the former Yugoslavia had several companies that were producing bathing suits. In Slovenia, right now, we have about 13 producers of some smaller ones, some boutique ones, or some big companies that are producing, still uh, fabricating the, the bathing suits. As in many other countries, um, May, June, and uh, July and August numbers of uh, women magazines were producing pictures and photos of what is fashion right now, which colors are fashionable, which models are fashionable. And they were also producing sewing patterns for making your own suit, especially the, the journalists from the 50s and 60s. So if you could not afford to buy a bathing suit, you could make uh, your own. Well, this is the picture of the beach that was taken the last summer and uh, you can see that uh, it depicts completely different picture that you would expect from a bathing uh, area you can see people in t-shirts and, and and trousers and shorts uh, mixed with bathers in bikinis so it's a kind of um, uh, different different way of using uh, the beach and of course with this also can different fashion on the seaside, not just uh, bathing suits. I, th I think that I will have to expand my collection with the sun protection t-shirts and the trousers and trunks and, and hats and so on to complement the, the, the uh, bathing suit and, and swimsuit. So um, this, let's jump into the sea and thank you for your attention. Uh, brilliant. Thank yeah, you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you, Amber. Um, it's been um, there's the comments in the in the chat are, are basically just to say thank you very much indeed to all of the speakers because it's been a really fascinating um, session. I think um, having Tommy's perspective at the end there and seeing it's the sort of the differences, but un basically the similarities, isn't it, a across yeah. the continent? You know. It all feels very familiar, even though it's in a different setting. And I think that's a really, really interesting perspective to to get your take on it and to see how that relates to what we know here. And um, yeah, very interesting. And something Fred Gray um, said about um, the the change from seaside costumes first to sea bathing, dipping and swimming, and then into the the um, sunbathing more latterly, and how that's all changed. And and we see the same progress because those trends are are um, trans-European, aren't they? Well, throughout the world, really. So um, fantastic selection of um, talks. I'm not sure we've got much time for discussion now, I'm afraid. But um, thank you to everybody who has attended. Um, if you do have any questions that you want us to pass on to the speakers, we'd be very, very happy to do that. Um, and our next 
uh, seminar is going to be coming up in January and we are going to be looking at seaside entertainment. So that all the details of that will be coming out in a mailing to you. We'll put that on our social media as well. Um, and um, we've got the youngest Punch and Judy man, um, Joe, who lives in Brighton and uh, works at Swanage Beach. You may have seen him. Um, we've got uh, speakers about hippodromes in the uh, sort of turn of the century period. And we've also got a speaker from the, the fascinating new museum uh, about to open in March next year, Showtown in Blackpool. So that's going to be another really interesting mix of speakers. And um, it's really a privilege to get all of you experts here together and to come at the subject with different perspectives. And, and everybody is saying in the chat, um, great talks. <laughs> they, they, they love it. Excellent. We're doing we're doing something right. Thank you very much indeed all for coming this afternoon. Um, really great to see you all. Thank you again to our speakers. Um, really enjoy listening to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.